Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to welcome you to this presentation. Uh, my name is Janibek Arinov. I am a postdoctoral scholar at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. Uh, today I'll be speaking about the EU Central Asia relations, the topic that I've been uh, extensively working uh, recently. Um, before we start, let me share my presentation. Here we go. Uh, the topic is again the EU Central Asia relations. Today I'll be talking about what is Central Asia and how far is it from the European Union. Then I will try to provide an overview uh, of the evolution of EU Central Asia relations in the past 30 years. Then I will also outline what has and hasn't been achieved in this. Um, partnership EU Central Asia relations. And then I will also briefly talk about the current state of EU Central Asia relations. And then uh, I will uh, also uh, speak a little bit about how the EU is perceived uh, in Central Asia in different actors uh, in the region. Before we go to EU Central Asia relations, what is Central Asia? Uh, Central Asia is a region which is at the heart of the Eurasian landmass. We can talk about different Central Asia. So for instance, from the cultural and historical point of view, Central Asia includes five um, states of post-Soviet states, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. Again, from the cultural and historical uh, point of view, it also so we can also consider as part of this bigger Central Asia, uh, Afghanistan, some parts of Pakistan, Xinjiang region of China, Mongolia, and some Northern regions, uh, I'm sorry, thousand regions of Russia. But if we speak about the political Central Asia, so we mostly mean this five Central Post-Soviet states in the region. So today I will be talking about exactly about this five, uh, regions and the relationship between the EU. Central Asia, as you can see uh, from the map, doesn't share a border uh, with the EU. Rather, Central Asia is designated as neighbors of neighbors. We have Eastern neighborhood policy, which includes six uh, other post-Soviet countries, Ukraine, uh, Belarus, Moldova, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. And Central Asian regions, more particularly Kazakhstan, uh, shares border with Azerbaijan. Uh, and in that sense, Central Asia becomes uh, neighbors of neighbors to the EU. We can divide the whole history of EU Central Asia relations into four main phases. The first stage includes the period from 1991-2000. It's the period when Central Asian states just got independence from the Soviet Union and the EU established first contacts with the region and it also launched first EU uh, initiatives in the region. The second stage can be considered as this interim period between 2001 and 2006. In this period, we see the growing uh, interests of the EU in the region, especially related to security and energy concerns or process. The third stage is from 2007 to 2018. Uh, it starts from the uh, uh, declaration of the EU's first strategy for Central Asia. And in the final stage, uh, we talk about uh, the period since 2000, from 2019, when the EU updated its strategy for the region. Let me provide some details, some more details about these different stages of uh, EU Central Asia relations. Stage number one, the early period of EU Central Asia relations. It, it's just to remind you that Central Asian countries got their independence in the late 1991. 
when the Soviet Union collapsed and five um, Central Asian states became became um, uh, independent. And during this period, in the early stage, Central Asia was of little interest to the EU. Uh, there, are four, there are kind of several reasons for that. Uh, first of all, the EU uh, had been kind of uh, uh, transforming internally. Uh, so the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, then the Enlargements in 92, 1995. So the EU itself was a very weak uh, ex, um, international actor as one actor, right? So also, and it's been uh, kind of, uh, it had been um, transforming internally. So of course, obviously in that case, the EU was kind of more inner looking country. Um, or in a looking actor, let's say, uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the EU's attention was more focused on Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Central and Eastern European countries. Why? Because with the fall of the Berlin Wall and with the fall of uh, communist socialist uh, regimes in Central and uh, Eastern European countries, uh, obviously, these countries were more important for the EU. Transformations in these countries were more, more important for the EU. For the EU. Uh, if we speak about the post-Soviet space, uh, then obviously in this post-Soviet state space, both the Baltic states, Russia and Ukraine uh, were more important for the EU. So the EU's focus more on those countries rather than uh, on distant, unknown uh, Central Asia. And also instability in the Balkans also kind of uh, attracted the EU's attention uh, when all the fall of the Yugoslavia um, and this uh, long lasting conflicts in the Balkans between different states. And obviously the EU was not in a position to pay more attention to this again, distant unknown Central Asia. Uh, so uh, some uh, Central Asia, uh, some European diplomats of that time of early 1990s even recognized that possibly if Central Asia was kind of more unstable, uh, with more conflict, the EU uh, had possibly uh, paid more attention to that. So compared to the Balkans, um, Central Asia considered as a more or less stable uh, region. So, but it doesn't mean that the EU was ignorant of the region. Gender. No, uh, the EU uh, tried to establish, again, um, as an institution, as a single actor, tried to establish diplomatic contacts with the region. Uh, with the region. We see the establishment of first uh, diplomatic um, contacts uh, in 1993, and the EU opened its first delegation to the region, which was situated in Almaty and with small offices in, in in, in Kyrgyzstan and uh, Tajikistan, and also Europe House in, in Uzbekistan. But again, it was um, quite a small uh, delegation to the region back then. Uh, but we also had some member states we, uh, that pursued more active policy in the region. First of all, Germany, opening up um, embassies in all five countries. We can speak also about the, the UK, uh, which also was very, very, very active in the region. France, Italy. So besides EU as a single actor, we also kind of had lots of um, uh, European countries kind of establishing official relations with the region. As for the EU, uh, it's the, the first program or the first project that it initiated in the region was TASIS uh, in 1991, a technical assistance to the Commonwealth of Independent States. So basically, TASIS covered 12 uh, countries out of 15, uh, post-Soviet countries out of 15, excluding the Baltic, three Baltic states. Uh, so it was an analog of the payer program uh, for Poland and Hungary to help them to, uh, to go through this uh, internal political and economic um, transformation. So uh, TASIS basically was the analog of this payer. But again, if we look at the um, Tassis, in more details at Tassis, Tassis was more for Russia and Ukraine and, 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 and then Belarus, then the Caucasian states and Central Asian countries were not uh, the kind of the, the most important uh, participants of this Tassis. Basically, Tassis provided mostly 
technical assistance to the countries uh, to, of the region uh, in kind of uh, providing economic transformations, political transformations, state building, and so on and so forth. Then we also saw the launch of uh, two um, flagship uh, projects or programs back then, initiatives by the EU. Uh, the first one is being uh, Trasteca, uh, Transport Corridor of Europe, Caucasus, Asia, and Innogate, uh, Interstate Oil and Gas Transportation to Europe. So these two programs were the projects were more about the, the transportation links between, uh, let's say, Asia, Europe, and then the, and the regions between them. Uh, then uh, in 1995, the EU signed its first uh, agreement with Central Asian countries. So partnership and cooperation agreements with Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan was signed in 1995 and entered into force uh, in 1999, I guess, mainly. If I remember correctly, then the PCI, PCA with Tajikistan was signed in 2004 because of the internal uh, conflict there. Uh, internal civil war uh, in Tajikistan uh, in 1990. Um, so, and Turkmenistan is still kind of in the process uh, of um, uh, negotiating the PCA because it was freezed uh, given Turkmenistan's um, poor records in terms of human rights and democracy. So in this first stage, the EU's main interests include the transition of Central Asian countries or post-Soviet countries uh, or post-communist countries in general uh, from, from this communist um, state control uh, system to, to more democracy, to market economy, and as well as to reduce the scope, uh, of, uh, scope of conflict in the region. And all these projects, I mean, especially uh, within TASIS were exactly about uh, transition to the market industry. Then we had the second stage of EU Central Asia relations, which is it's a kind of a relatively smaller period. Um, and it starts basically from the um, global war against terrorism, the situation in Afghanistan uh, in 2001, when, when uh, with the invasion or with the um, military campaign in Afghanistan. Um, the region um, or Afghanistan's kind of neighbors acquired uh, acquired kind of brand new significance for many international uh, actors, including the EU and some European member states had uh, their military bases in Central Asian countries, especially uh, in, in Kyrgyzstan, in, in Uzbekistan, in Tennis, for instance, German military base. Uh, so given the situation in Afghanistan, uh, the securitization of the whole region, including Central Asia, uh, happened in the early uh, 2000s. The second reason was that the EU uh, was back then was expanding to the east, right? The enlargements of 2004, 2007 brought Central Asian countries uh, to the closer to the EU, right? Uh, so then it's the, when, when the Central Asia actually became the neighbors of neighbors. Also, this period was remarkable by the growing uh, EU interests in the energy sector, um, gas disputes between Ukraine and Russia, oil disputes, uh, oil, gas, uh, oil disputes between uh, Russia and, and, and Belarus in the mid 2000s um, made clear that um, the EU needs to look for alternative energy uh, suppliers. In that sense, Central Asia or the, the countries uh, that are uh, in the basin of uh, the Caspi, Caspian Sea uh, were of um, importance for the EU. So this was the period when the EU was trying to diversify its energy interests and especially uh, to build um, pipelines uh, uh, that bypass Russia, that exclude Russia. And also in the mid 2000s, uh, we saw a kind of wave of uprisings in post Soviet states, starting from Georgia, Ukraine. Then we had two uh, kind of uprisings in, in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan in 2005, uh, when in Kyrgyzstan, the first uh, president archive um, was overthrown uh, from presidency, and in Uzbekistan in May 2005, 
uh, and the Jan uprising, which was brutally kind of uh, uh, repressed by the government. And this kind of instabilities uh, in the region also made the EU to pay more attention to the region because we already, the EU already had, it was already involved in Afghanistan, which was unstable. And seeing other neighboring countries kind of becoming more unstable was a bit uh, problematic for the EU. So again, uh, the main EU interests in this period include, uh, again, we, in this period, the EU talks less about a democracy transition and market economy, rather pays more attention to hard security issues. So, so security concerns, especially on traditional uh, security issues, market traffic, migration, and uh, so on and so forth, uh, then uh, stable supply of energy resources, resources. And this led to the criticism of the EU over this prioritizing democracy over uh, security energy. Uh, in the main events in this period include the strategy paper 2002-2006. Basically, it was the revision of the taxes and what has been achieved, what hasn't been achieved, and the kind of um, learning from the experience of the past. They try, the EU tried to um, kind of uh, improve the efficiency of its project. And then we saw the launch of two uh, projects uh, in the security sector. The first one is Bonka border management uh, program in Central Asia, and then cut up uh, Central Asian drag action uh, program. So these two programs were basically more about um, better controlling um, borders uh, within the region and the, the border with Afghanistan um, was also important. And also kind of uh, trying to reduce uh, the narco traffic uh, from, from Afghanistan through Central Asia to the European market. Um, and then we also saw the launch of the Baku initiative in 2004, which is basically the initiative in the energy, energy sector when the EU wanted to bring together under one framework um, Central Asian and the Caucasian um, suppliers and other transition countries and the European uh, uh, consumers. Then this kind of growing interest, EU interest in the region uh, led to the launch of the adoption of the EU strategy for Central Asia, so in 2007. So this is a, a beginning of a new period, right? So at least uh, the adoption, it was the first strategy uh, for, for the EU. Um, but again, this strategy is not only about um, providing the overview of the EU's approach to Central Asia or to other external uh, actors. The strategy was also about kind of uh, having one voice within the member states, uh, kind of speaking with one voice as the EU. So the, the recipients of this strategy are not only Central Asians, but also the EU member states, just to outline the main directions of the uh, EU's uh, policy towards region as a single actor. Um, yes, the strategy was a new document, but at the same time, it's very difficult to claim that this, this strategy stipulated some kind of new agenda uh, for EU Central Asia relations. Rather, the majority of EU objectives remained the same. So the strategy included seven priority uh, directions. The first one was human rights and democracy. Then we have uh, youth and education, economic development, trade, um, trade and investment, uh, energy and transport, environment and water, combating common threats and intercultural dialogue. So all these aims, all these directions had already been there before the adoption of the strategy. But their strategy just um, provided one kind of uh, framework for all directions and, and kind of more cohesion between, between the different directions. So the main activities in this period included, uh, first of all, TASIS, uh, which was, uh, which had been being implemented since 1991, was replaced by development cooperation uh, instrument. So if TASIS previously was an instrument solely for the post-Soviet states, 12 post-Soviet states, now DCI was a kind of, uh, worldwide instrument, one of the instruments of the EU. And, and then the, the EU's, um, but the majority of EU's development aid to the region now 
went through the development cooperation uh, instrument. So also this implied that the EU increases its but increased its budget for the region, budget for development aid. Now it was about 750 million euro for 2007 and 2013. Uh, then a, a new um, post was um, created, EU Special Representative for Central Asia. Uh, so basically, this was the person, um, or uh, yeah, the person uh, who was responsible for establishing political context in the region and for, to promoting the EU's policy. So uh, it was a very good. Um, uh, decision to increase the EU's overall visibility, political visibility, first of all, uh, in the region. So before 2007 or before 2009, actually, uh, the EU had only one um, delegation in the region, which was in, in, in Kazakhstan, uh, which covered all other, other countries. Again, that was small offices in, in Kyrgyzstan and uh, Tajikistan and Europe House in Uzbekistan later in, in Turkmenistan, uh, but with the launch of the strategy, the EU tried to increase its political visibility. So the first move was uh, the appointment of EU special representative for Central Asia. The second move was to open new delegations in Kyrgyzstan in 2007, Tajikistan in 2009, and in Uzbekistan in 2012. And there was Europe House in, in Turkmenistan. In other words, now the EU as one single actor had some kind of pro political presence in all um, countries of the region. Also, the EU's strategy um, uh, established uh, three new initiatives. So education, EU education initiative, EU rule of law initiative, and EU war initiative. Then we have the current, uh, the last stage, which starts from 2009. So the EU's first strategy was, effect, uh, was in effect for over 10 years, right? And from 2007. So already somewhere in mid 2010s, there was a quite intensive discussion within the EU that the EU needs to update its strategy for Central Asia, especially Latvian presidency in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, oh, 2015, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah 2015. Um, was kind of Latvian presence was pushing uh, very hard to update uh, the EU's vision towards Central Asia. And uh, there are several reasons for that. Again, Central Asian states have significantly changed since 2007. Uh, right? The political, uh, in political sense, maybe um, there was more or less the kind of uh, no change. We still had uh, basically more authoritarian states in the region, uh, in the region. Uh, but uh, there have been quite uh, important uh, developments since 2007 in the region, in economic sense, um, in, in other kind of uh, dimensions. On the other hand, the geopolitical context uh, in the region has changed significantly from 2007. So basically this include more active uh, Russia and China or more uh, kind of um, uh, Russia and China kind of pursuing more uh, proactive policies in the region, right? So, so uh, especially uh, the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013 by China uh, and then uh, we had uh, this um, Crimean annexation in 2014 and deterioration of EU-Russia relations, which implied that um, EU-Russia uh, competition uh, would continue in Central Asia as well. So the geopolitical context in the region was quite complex compared to, to 2007. And also the EU has changed significantly compared to 2007, right? So, um, um, internal economic crisis, uh, the uh, migration crisis um, of 2015, and then um, lots of internal um, disagreements, political disagreements within EU member states, the Brexit by then. Uh, so all this made uh, that, okay, the EU now is a bit different after to 2007. Uh, which implied that the EU started kind of revisiting its 
external strategy in general. So we saw the adoption of the EU global strategy in 2016. And since then, the all, almost all of the EU strategies um, have been um, step by step updated. And the turn, um, the, the Central Asian's turn was, uh, came in 2019, when uh, after a couple of years of discussion, I guess, internal discussion, um, several months of internal discussion, I would say, uh, the EU uh, finally uh, presented its new strategy. Uh, in the strategy, new strategy, there are kind of three directions. So first, the partnering for resilience, so which includes democracy, human rights, rule of law, border management, migration, and other security concerns, environment, climate, and water. Uh, partnering for prosperity is more about the economic reforms, connectivity, youth, education, culture, and innovation, and then work, working better together. If we look at this kind of three main directions uh, and, and sub kind of uh, category within each direction, we don't see much change compared to the strategy of 2007. Again, this strategy is not about the update of EU's interests in the region. So the EU's interests in the region have been more or less stable uh, throughout these years. But the strategy is more about the approach, the EU's new approach towards the region, how the EU pursue, would pursue its, its goals in the region. Currently, um, the EU is still in the process of kind of rethinking its whole foreign policy or whole external relations, right? It's not, the, the, the task is not completed yet. So there still is, uh, the EU is still kind of trying to, to um, come up with a coherent vision what kind of actor it is and it will be uh, in external relations, right? Uh, so we are, we are still kind of, um, we, see this in its implications in Central Asia as well. So in this framework of transformation, I would say, right, they use internal, internal relations. The EU has also been updating the legal framework for cooperation with Central Asia. So as I mentioned, the partnership and first partnership and cooperation agreement with Central Asian countries was assigned back in 1995, right? So, and it's been uh, quite, how many years? More than 25 years uh, since the first uh, signing of the agreements. And starting from, from early 2010, the EU started kind of, uh, again, updating this framework. After a long um, periods of uh, consultations, uh, Kazakhs, the, the EU finally signed its first enhanced partnership and cooperation agreement with Kazakhstan in 2010. And now the new, new agreement is ready uh, and uh, initial between the EU and Kyrgyzstan. Uzbekistan is now in the process of negotiating its own enhanced partnership and cooperation agreements. So then, then Tajikistan and uh, possibly, um, okay, at, at this point, it's I think better to spell about Tajikistan. So Tajikistan may join this um, group later, so may sign uh, enhanced partnership cooperation agreement. Later, I guess um, they will, they may start negotiations uh, uh, then GSP status for Kyrgyzstan in 2016 and Uzbekistan this year. So basically GSP status um, provides a tax a customs. Uh, there's no custom uh, tax, custom tax. Right? So non-tariff, uh, all tariff barriers are uh, removed uh, for certain kinds of goods uh, to, ex to be exported uh, to the European market. Um, also, um, currently, especially in the last few months, we see that the situation in Afghanistan um, and its possible uh, impact uh, on EU Central Asia relations. Since 2001, I guess, I mean, in, since early 2000s, uh, Afghanistan was one of the kind of points, um, uh, important points for, for EU's engagement with Central Asia. Again, all security related issues, were mostly connected to the situation in Afghanistan. And uh, the EU has been trying to, to uh, link Afghanistan uh, economically, politically, culturally to the Central Asia, so, so to have, so, uh, so to speak, the bigger Central Asia. Um, 
But with the removal of NATO troops uh, from Afghanistan, now it's not clear whether the EU will have the same kind of interest in the region. Uh, because at this moment, uh, it's very difficult to say how the EU will approach this new regime in Afghanistan, right? So although uh, in Brussels, um, it's, it was being clearly made that the EU is not going to recognize Taliban anytime soon as a legitimate uh, political kind of uh, regime. But there have been a lot of calls to engage with Taliban where possible, to speak to Taliban, or Taliban where it's possible, right? Uh, so I think a lot will depend on how the EU uh, will approach uh, Afghanistan in, in, uh, in the future. So in this situation in Afghanistan, uh, also impacts the depth of EU Central Asia relations. Again, Central Asia was very kind of uh, became significant for external actors, including because of the situation in Afghanistan. And the EU now um, uses a lot the so called principled pragmatism approach uh, when it comes to Central Asia, uh, but uh, how does it look like uh, in practice? So uh, the EU uh, has been accused a lot, especially in the context of Central Asia, that it pursues more pragmatic uh, relationship rather than kind of normative, normative kind of uh, pushing uh, normative agenda. So basically sacrificing its democracy, human rights, and, and rule of law uh, interests to the energy and security interests. But now the EU say that, okay, the principle principle pragmatism is provoke, pursuing more pragmatic policy where it's possible. At the same time, kind of putting uh, the principles uh, right uh, at the top of their, um, at the top of the list. So, but it's not clear yet how it looks like in practice. Uh, so when this clash happens between normative and uh, uh, hard interests of the EU, how the EU, uh, how the EU gonna behave, right? What kind of decision the EU make? So this is not clear yet. So just summing up uh, the EU's 30 years long engagement with, with Central Asia, what has been achieved so far? I must say that the EU is not an unknown political object in Central Asia anymore. The EU is known, uh, the EU is present uh, and uh, the EU is doing something in Central Asia. So we can argue about the scale of the EU's presence, but at least people in Kazakhstan know that there is this kind of actor called the European Union. And the EU has become the biggest donor in the region. So as I mentioned previously for 2007 and 13, uh, the EU allocated 750 million uh, euro for the region. Uh, for the next period, 2014 and 2020, um, the amount was more than 1 billion. And now we are waiting for the next stage, uh, the confirmation of the budget for the next stage. And definitely um, the amount will be something about the same, if not slightly bigger. And the EU is a key trading partner for Central Asian countries. Uh, so, but uh, we should keep in mind that when we talk about this EU-Central Asia trade relations, we mostly talk about EU-Kazakhstan trade relations, right? Because 80%, over 80% of EU-Central Asia trade uh, is constituted by EU-Kazakhstan trade. So in 2020, the trade turnover was 18 and 5 uh, billion euro. It's 30% of Kazakhstan's total trade, where, which makes the EU, again, the biggest uh, trading partner for Kazakhstan, uh, followed by China and Russia. And then again, it's over 80% of EU total uh, trade. Uh, so again, if we talk about the structure of this trade, uh, again, about 80, around 80, 75, 80% is Kazakhstan's 
oil exports to the European market. So in other words, yes, this uh, amount or this trade turnover seems quite impressive in the context of Central Asia. Obviously, Central Asia or Kazakhstan is not the um, kind of key trading partner for, for, for the EU, but EU is a key trading partner for, for Kazakhstan. But we should also um, understand that this is mostly one way export of oil and other raw materials to the European market. So the trade is not that much diversified. And the EU is also a key investment partner for Central Asian countries. Again, when we mean this, we basically talk about Kazakhstan. So about 70% of EU's investments in the region uh, has been in Kazakhstan, to Kazakhstan. So in the last 15 years, it constituted about 150 million. Uh, billion euro uh, investments in Kazakhstan. But again, there are certain pitfalls here. So basically, if we kind of uh, track down the, the, the records, investment records from Europe to, to, from the EU to Kazakhstan, we see that the Netherlands and uh, other similar countries or destinations are listed as top uh, investors in Kazakhstan. But the Netherlands, is a tax haven. So even if formally the money um, are invested from Netherlands, the origins of uh, those investments may not necessarily be European. In many cases, it's Kazakhstan's companies um, kind of moving money to this uh, tax uh, havens, including to the Netherlands, and then the Netherlands uh, reinvesting those money again back to Kazakhstan. So again, we should be very careful here about uh, to what extent uh, these EU investments have the European origin behind. And I must say that uh, the EU has now its own niche, right, uh, in Central Asia. So basically the EU um, works in those fields, in those sectors where normally other actors uh, do, not, do not pay much attention. So this includes uh, climate changes. Now, I mean, uh, in the last five, six years, I think the climate uh, issue uh, has become a top priority for EU Central Asia relations. We see a lot of uh, initiatives by the EU in the sector, a lot of programs, a lot of kind of money going, uh, EU development aid going uh, exactly to this climate uh, change, uh, climate issues. Water issues, again, another uh, very important, very um, difficult issue in Central Asia given this biggest disputes between Central Asian countries uh, for the resource, water, water resources, right? So, so the EU here has a say, and the EU is doing uh, kind of a lot of work in the water management sector, kind of trying to bring together all Central Asian countries and negotiating and uh, helping to more efficiently uh, use water resources in the region. Water management is another kind of very important sector where the EU helps a lot. Uh, so especially the focus has been on EU, sorry, on Central Asia, Afghanistan border, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan border, and also uh, on the border in the Fergana Valley, right? Fergana Valley is, uh, Valley is one of the most complicated, let's say, regions uh, or areas in Central Asia where uh, there are a lot of border issues uh, between Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan. So, and, 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 and the EU is trying to help there to manage this border. Um, and obviously democracy, I think um, the EU, despite a lot of criticism, uh, has been kind of consistent, at least rhetorically, that the democracy is a top priority, human rights, democracy, and all those uh, and all other related issues, including rule of law, uh, good governance, are top priority for EU's policies in the region. But again, we can argue a lot about to what extent it has achieved its goals. On. And then gender issues, very important issue, right? In Central Asian context, the EU is helping establishing a lot of programs related to gender, promoting kind of gender equality. Um, youth again would be another kind of um, engagement with youth would be one of the main topics when areas where the EU uh, education youth uh, that where the EU does a lot of work 
compared to other uh, actors. So basically, the EU again has its own niche in the Central Asia. It has its own brand. It has its own kind of um, the the list of issues that it wants to to promote. What hasn't been achieved so far in EU Central Asia relations? I must say that first of all, the EU hasn't become a prim primary actor in Central Asia. But it's not a kind of criticism in the uh, uh, toward the EU because the EU um, doesn't have to become a primary actor, cannot become a primary actor in all regions, including Central Asia, especially given Central Asia's kind of um, distance from the EU, its secondary position for the EU. So obviously, we cannot expect that the EU will become a primary actor in this region. And the EU doesn't have any intentions to become a primary actor uh, in the region. Uh, and it's acknowledged a lot. But still, um, to, to promote certain kind of um, agendas in the region, especially political sensitive agendas like democracy, human rights, um, being a secondary actor doesn't help much in those kind of um, very sensitive issues. Again, human rights, democracy related goals. Again, this has been uh, a top priority, at least rhetorically, again, uh, for the EU right from the very beginning of EU Central Asia relations in early 1990s. So now a lot of, has, a lot of criticism has been uh, addressed toward the EU, again, uh, dilemma between uh, normative uh, interests and, and hard interests in security and energy. So, but we must be a bit realistic again. Um, the EU cannot alone uh, democratize uh, other countries, uh, especially if those countries are not given kind of this, the EU's possibly the most uh, significant weapon, right? The accession uh, to the EU, uh, membership uh, prospects uh, to the EU. Uh, so Central Asian countries will never become members of the EU. Uh, so that's why, um, again, the EU not being a primary actor, not having um, kind of uh, much leverage uh, in Central Asia cannot uh, solely promote human rights and democracy uh, if there is no demand uh, from the region or from, from uh, especially from the main political actors in the region. But the EU is trying. Uh, to engage more with the NGO, with civil society, with other kind of uh, uh, actors in the region, just to make sure that the, the, there is a process, right? There is you know, step by step small changes. But another criticism here addressed toward the EU that the EU has shifted from hard democracy, human rights issues to more softer rule of law, good governance kind of uh, issues. So again, I think it's a kind of uh, pragmatic decision uh, to shift to those kind of sectors where the EU actually can achieve something, right? In terms of good governance, rule of law, uh, instead, of, instead of kind of um, pushing hard on human rights and democracy, especially if you don't have any kind of pressure and green instruments. So I think that also was a sign of this pragmatic, uh, intentional move from not achievable, let's say, to more achievable uh, kind of agendas. Energy related goals, again, one of the main um, uh, issues on the agenda, the EU's agenda in Central Asia since, um, again, 1990s, we've seen lots of uh, different projects. So, to what extent the EU has achieved this goal? It's difficult to say. On the one hand, I mean, um, we see that the EU Central Asian oil. First of all, Kazakhstan's oil directly goes uh, to the EU. So the EU is the main uh, importer of Kazakhstan's oil. But gas, uh, Central Asian gas, uh, the, the, the EU's primary goal was to diversify its uh, gas supplies, right? Uh, that would bypass Russia. So decrease the level of dependence on Russia. Uh, and we remember this Nabucco project, for instance, in 2000, uh, in the summer mid 2000s and then early 2010. And those kind of projects uh, have never been uh, accomplished. Uh, so in other words, now the EU 
uh, doesn't have access to Central Asian gas. Uh, and, then, and then in that sense, possibly if we take this as a main indicator, uh, possibly we can say that okay, the EU hasn't achieved its, uh, achieved its uh, energy related or gas related goals. Security related goals, again, security is a very complex issue here. For, for the EU, security is a bit different uh, than for the regional political regime. So the EU understands security as a kind of um, complex um, interlinked uh, kind of a list of issues, including uh, the quality of life, including um, economic development, social protection, including other non-traditional uh, kind of security threats. So while the political regimes in the region mostly understand security as more kind of um, political stability in, in their own countries, right? So um, having no opposition, for instance, uh, is part of this political stability for, for the regional regime. So having this kind of two different understandings of what security is, uh, possible we can also argue that, okay, the EU hasn't reach, achieved uh, all the goals stated uh, in the, uh, in different kind of papers and strategies, all right? And we also shouldn't overestimate the impact uh, of well, the initiative that we had to bomb uh, Kadak, obviously, they have done kind of positive things on the ground, very so small scale things, but um, it's difficult to say that they somehow changed, structurally changed um, the security issues. Uh, in the region. Again, the EU cannot uh, alone um, solve all the security problems. In the region. Uh, so that also should be kept in the time. Um, the impact of EU-led initiatives, to what extent, all those initiatives in different kind of fields uh, have impact um, on the region. It's again, a quite difficult question to answer, but again, there have been a lot of uh, criticism towards the impact uh, of EU-led initiatives, uh, including that uh, normally that EU-led initiatives are too small uh, to make any kind of visible impact. Uh, and there is a lot of bureaucracy uh, in, EU can, uh, in EU-led initiatives that um, make the complicated situation. And there have been a lot of criticism that the EU funds uh, certain kind of projects, but then uh, they uh, invite uh, European experts for, to provide technical assistance to within this project. And basically all the money uh, um, devoted to this project goes back as a salaries, as a kind of uh, travel trips, all this money go back uh, to Europe again. So all this technical assistance kind of uh, projects um, have been criticized heavily, both by, by the region and uh, regional states, uh, also by some observers uh, in, in the Europe. Also, we also see sometimes uh, that the EU um, doesn't have a single voice in the region. So multiple and competing interests, especially in the economic sector. So uh, maybe it's also one of the kind of um, issues uh, in the region. But I must say that uh, despite this criticism expressed but mostly by local uh, observers in Central Asia, I must say that on many important issues, right? On many kind of, uh, important political issues maybe, the EU tries to um, speak with one voice, with single words. So, so that happens a lot. At least I observed that, okay, if there is any kind of politically, political issues especially, then the EU tries to speak with one voice. As for economics, I mean, the competition between different uh, countries for, for, for economic kind of resources, for, for energy, for other kind of things, or between different companies from different countries, I think that's a natural kind of um, part of the EU. Uh, and also the visibility issue has been raised a lot that the EU actually does something in the region, but nobody knows about what the EU does. And the EU itself acknowledges that, uh, that there is a visibility issue, not only in Central Asia, but generally in the EU's external uh, relations elsewhere. 
so that's also maybe kind of, uh, and the, the strategy of 2019 makes clear that the, okay, the EU needs uh, increase its visibility. That's also in the EU's uh, global strategy from 2016. So possibly in the future, we see kind of better uh, communication of EU policies to the local stakeholders and also to the European, um, European stakeholders, European uh, citizens. Uh, now in this part, I would like just to briefly mention what are expected from the EU by Central Asia. So basically so far, I've been kind of talking more about the EU's perspective to the Central Asia. Now, I just would like to briefly mention what, how Central Asians perceive the EU and what Central Asians expect from the EU. First of all, I must say that the EU is one of the most trusted um, actors in the region. It's more benevolent compared to others, especially compared to the US and China. And among certain groups uh, in Central Asian societies, also the EU is more trusted than Russia. Especially we, we see this after the, uh, the annexation of Crimea and the Russia's uh, aggression uh, in the Eastern uh, Ukraine. Uh, so this kind of events made some members of Central Asian society to uh, to reconsider their uh, kind of attitudes towards Russia, but again, we shouldn't over uh, over kind of uh, estimate this. And, and and Russia is still perceived as the first and primary partner actor for many citizens in, in Central Asian countries, especially it's visible in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. But still, um, when it comes to trust, when it comes to uh, benevolence, the EU is one of the most uh, trusted actors in the region. But, but the paradox here is that, um, again, uh, international relations theory say that the actors are trusted when they are weak. Basically, the role of the EU as a secondary player rather than primary player makes it a benevolent, seems to make it a benevolent actor in the region. If I assume that the EU was more active, was more kind of uh, present in the region, possibly we wouldn't uh, see um, this kind of uh, perceived benevolence on the EU. So this is the paradox between weakness on the one hand and the more trust on the other. The EU is admired, we must say, uh, still a lot of people, uh, ordinary people in, in Central Asia, they admire the European quality of life. Uh, to a certain extent, European democracy and human rights there. Uh, European culture, basically, and so-called European standards, right? By standards, I mean, everything can fall under this concept of standards. Everything positively associated with the EU or European country in general uh, can be said as a kind of standard, right? So we say this kind of European standards kind of thing in our everyday life here almost uh, all the time. But again, uh, this admiration, it's not clear. I mean, it's very difficult to empirically um, separate this admiration towards the EU from admiration towards Europe, right? Uh, so because the EU historically, oh, you, sorry, not EU, but Europe, Europe had this historically had this very idealized image of, uh, idealized image of, kind of something positive, right? So we know that for Russia, for instance, Europe has been the significant other for many, many centuries, right? And Central Asian countries being part of first this Russian empire, then the Soviet Union, and for, for Central Asians, even Europe is one of the others, uh, significant others in that sense. So many people still, I, again, I can't say the majority, but still there are a lot of people who identify themselves belonging in European family in a kind of more broader sense, rather than being Asian, or well, now it has become trendy to say Eurasian, right? Uh, I had, uh, I did one research with the younger generation um, in, in Kazakhstan, and for many of them, being Asian doesn't carry much meaning because for them, Asia is not something clear. So the boundaries of Asia and Asia are not clear for many. So is Asia China? Is Asia uh, Japan? Is Asia India? 
East Asia Arab state. So it's not clear. So in that sense, Asia is very much heterogeneous for many people. So as for Eurasia, yes, it's a kind of top-down narrative in, in Kazakhstan, especially when, when Kazakhstan positions officially itself as a Eurasian kind of country, but it doesn't seem to find much resonance among ordinary citizens. For, for many of them, again, Eurasian doesn't seem to carry much meaning. And in that sense, many people still, especially younger generations, still, still kind of see themselves as part of bigger Europe, I would say. Uh, so I think this admiration towards Europe is not necessarily caused by the EU's activities in the region. As we said that the EU's activities uh, in many cases are not visible in the region. Rather this idealized image of Europe uh, is making a service uh, for, for, for the EU in a sense that the EU is admired as part of this Europe. And also this means that the EU is wanted to be more active uh, in the region. So uh, again, my own kind of research indicates that uh, people tend to prefer more investment from the EU rather than from China. Uh, people tend to um, prefer kind of education, higher education in, in European countries rather than uh, in Russia or in, in China. But in fact, I mean, we have more students going to Russian universities or to Chinese universities. I mean, uh, if we consider uh, this, um, because basically there are more, more opportunities or more scholarships there. But many, many still want to go to, to the EU countries to get European education. So uh, the EU is wanted to pursue more democratic kind of, um, okay, democracy is a bit tricky issue here because the society are kind of polar uh, visions in society. So some part of uh, Central Asian societies um, want the EU to be more active uh, in terms of promoting human rights, democracy, and obviously culture. So again, this uh, wish to see more active EU is part of this more trust to the EU, right? So the EU is trusted, that's why, and the EU is admired, that's why the EU, uh, there is kind of uh, uh, wish to see a better, a more active EU. On the other hand, we see that the EU's image is being kind of um, deteriorated. So I call decaying Europe image. Uh, recently kind of growing in the region, especially not only in Central Asia, but we can observe this in, in Russia as well, especially after the uh, 2019 with the uh, annexation of Crimea and uh, conflict in, in Donbass and Lugansk. So basically this decaying Europe image means that the EU is seen as um, degrading uh, as in economic degradation, right? So again, a lot has to do with the debt crisis uh, in some European countries. Right? Uh, when you see on TV or on newspapers on everyday basis that the EU is kind of uh, going to die economically, for instance, Greece and Spain, and then we had Italy, uh, economic issues within the EU, unemployment issues, and all this has been widely covered in in by the local media as well as by the Russian media. And Russian media has very strong uh, presence in Central Asian countries, especially in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And of course that provides a kind of image where the EU is kind of dying uh, economically, right? Then uh, political uh, disagreements within the EU also contribute to this decaying uh, Europe. So, so a lot of discussions, uh, a lot of um, um, disagreements within member states, especially uh, given the Brexit and especially uh, the debates over the migration crisis back in 2015 and 16. And again, all these events are widely covered in the local media and that obviously provides uh, kind of negative um, perceptions, uh, forms negative perceptions about political agreement or disagreement in the EU. In cultural sense, again, uh, I remember in 2015 and 16, there has been a lot about the fact that the EU is losing its cultural kind of identity. So now we see more migrants in European countries. And again, I had a research um, uh, on this topic and uh, 
I've heard many people uh, interviewed many people saying, okay, if you, for instance, if you go to Paris, you don't see um, kind of, uh, you see a lot of uh, migrants or refugees in Par uh, streets of the Paris or any other European uh, city. So a kind of this migration refugee uh, issues of flows changing this cultural identity of the EU. So it's seen something as something negative by the majority uh, in the region, I assume. And then uh, the moral degradation, again, this comes to the very much about this human rights issues when, uh, when uh, the rights of uh, different minorities, first of all, sexual minorities, um, are seen something uh, immoral or something inappropriate, right? So, so again, uh, Central Asian societies are very much, uh, okay, if not very much, but uh, traditional, uh, in many senses, uh, so for, for many people in Central Asian societies, again, the rights of sexual minorities and other minorities is not something um, positive. For, for many of them, it's still something negative. So in that context, obviously, the EU, uh, which is seen as allowing um, kind of uh, single one gender marriages, intergender marriages, and so on and so forth, seen as a kind of uh, experiencing more experiencing moral degradation. So all these elements contribute to this decaying Europe image. But still, um, still, uh, the EU is admired and trusted. But maybe we see this shift of the image of the EU among certain uh, segments of Central Asian populations. Um, and I still argue that the positive image of the EU is still a competitive advantage of the EU vis-a-vis -vis more powerful actors in Central Asia. So basically the EU will not and cannot compete with Russia, China, and possibly with the US in terms of political and geopolitical influence on the region, but the EU has one very strong asset at the moment, which is a positive image. And Russia and China do not have such kind of positive image, at least there are kind of uh, tensions in society, what kind of actor China, Russia is, for instance. Some believe that it's good, positive, others believe that it's negative and uh, dangerous. When it comes to China, definitely the majority of people, people in Central Asian society think that China is a kind of threatening, the global xenophobia is quite strong in the region. So in that sense, the EU enjoys very much positive image, and that's, uh, I think, the main competitive advantage of the EU. So this is the just illustration of this admiration towards the EU, as I said, European standards. So in the cities of um, Central Asian, um, or in the streets of Central Asian uh, uh, cities, you see a lot of this uh, prefix euro, right? When you put uh, euro in your, when you use euro prefix in many kind of business type of uh, advertisements. So for instance, we see here some of the, um, uh, businesses, Euro Pharma, uh, Euro Pharmacy, Euro uh, Fashion, uh, top right on the top uh, right, or Euro Gourmand, it's a kind of canteen or food store uh, on the uh, left, right. So you see a lot of this kind of Euro prefix in every day. So you see also this kind of links to the um, European kind of flags, right? At least three of them has this blue color and uh, and the stars um, saying that uh, it's a kind of fear. So basically what they do from the marketing point of view, they just try to promote that they have these European standards or the European quality uh, in this businesses. So again, it's a very much Euro or admiration towards European standards or towards European quality of life and stuff. So it's very much present in the, in the region. And finally, uh, the final slide, just I would like to say a few words about uh, what can be done and what should be done in the future. Obviously, EU will not and cannot be a primary actor in Central Asia. And we should, when we criticize the EU a lot for different kind of things, we expect that the EU uh, is a kind of primary actor. No, the EU definitely is a secondary actor in Central Asia. So that's why um, our expectations from the EU as policies also should be kind of should match uh, this uh, role of the EU. Uh, and significant deepening of EU really, Central Asian relations should be expected in the near future. I mean, I personally do not see any kind of uh, prerequisites for those. Again, 
with the situation in Afghanistan and European countries living in Afghanistan, I think that the past of Central Asia, and given the very complex um, um, geopolitical context in Central Asia, I think that the EU possibly at best uh, try to preserve this, the current level of uh, relations uh, between Central Asian countries. And uh, now it's kind of very popular in, in has become a buzzword in, in EU, for instance, the, the, the term connectivity, Right, the EU's connectivity strategy, Europe Asia connectivity strategy. Now we are expecting the EU's global connectivity strategy. And obviously, if we're talking about Europe and Asia, then part of landless connectivity goes through Central Asia. But again, we don't know to what extent this project, these are ambitious projects, uh, uh, will be implemented in practice. But yeah, I don't think at this point that we should expect something bigger, uh, some changes in EU central Asia relations. And also, uh, I think that the, in many cases, the EU's um, goals in Central Asia are very grandiose, very broad, very declaratory. Uh, so on the one hand, I understand this because, the, I mean, again, as I mentioned, the, 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 those kind of strategic documents are not there to provide step-by-step detailed kind of um, instructions how that you're gonna uh, act in those countries. Just this are just summary of very broad directions and approaches. On the other hand, I mean, at least uh, for the EU for itself should be um, kind of, uh, should pursue more realistic achievable goals um, in the region. Maybe that in that sense, we will see kind of more positive impact in the region. And principle pragmatism, again, I think that pragmatism should be at the heart of the EU's uh, policy. If it comes with the principle pragmatism, that's also fine. But the meaning here is that the EU um, should work where it can work and uh, where it can make an impact, rather than kind of linking uh, its activities to other kind of uh, um, Issues. So, so the pragmatism should be at the heart of this policy. And also, it's sometimes very difficult to avoid, but the EU should try to avoid the geopolitization of these central Asian relations. Again, given Russia's growing interests of kind of um, um, more assertive policy in the region, China's growing presence in the region, uh, and, and given very uh, problematic at the moment relations between EU and Russia, EU and China, I think the EU at least should try to uh, try to avoid the geopolitization of the region. So as long as this is possible, then the EU have space to operate. But if EU Central Asia relations become uh, geopoliticized, then it will be harder for the EU to engage with Central Asian states, and also it will become harder for Central Asian states to engage with the EU, right? Because again, Russia's and China's uh, pressure influence is quite um, in, 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 in Britain. And also where it's possible, the EU should engage other regional actors. Again, um, the strategy doesn't specify that the EU will engage strategy for Central Asia from 2019 doesn't specify that they engage with the China or Russia, but still, um, if there if there is a place, uh, there is a space, then it should try to engage this reason, uh, the, the, this country is in the region. Uh, otherwise, again, the EU cannot uh, make much uh, if Russia or China will be opposing its policies in the region, because, again, yeah, given their influence. So thank you for your attention. Um, and again, um, we can talk a lot about, about the EU Central Asia relations. We can um, uh, talk a lot about whether it's, it has been successful or unsuccessful, but again, uh, we should be clear um, about the leverage that the EU has, about the influence that the EU has, about the impact that the EU can make. But at this point, obviously, the EU is one of the key partners for all Central Asian countries, not only from the economic aspect, especially in Kazakhstan, but also to balance um, other actors in the region, uh, right? Because um, again, the all Central Asian countries pursue multi vectors foreign policy, so they want to, to try to diversify their relations. 
And especially now, it's very important for Central Asian countries to to balance against uh, against to a certain extent against Russia, to, get, to balance against China. And in that sense, the EU, Europe, the EU is the candidate number one. So this is all. It's just a small overview of this uh, EU Central Asia relations. Um, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that this overview uh, was helpful for you. Thank you again.